Hi, my name is Dr. John Ripoli, and today we're talking about autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is one of the fastest growing diseases that the world is seeing, especially today here in the United States. The National Institutes of Health estimate that there's about 20 plus million people uh, walking around with some form of autoimmune disease. But that doesn't tell the whole picture because they're basing that on about 20 or so named diagnoses. Today we know that there are now over a hundred types of autoimmune diseases. So if we include that in the picture, we're now looking at estimates of about 50 million people in the United States. Um, interestingly, the average autoimmune patient will probably see approximately four or five doctors before being diagnosed. Um, they usually throughout that period will also be labeled, about 45% of them will be labeled as a hypochondriac. And we know that autoimmune disease in general attacks um, our, our longevity as well as our aging. So with our life expectancy, it decreases by about 10 to 15 years, and then of course our quality of life or aging decreases dramatically, depending on the type of autoimmune condition, whether it be like say multiple sclerosis um, or something like Crohn's disease. So what is autoimmunity? In essence, it's our immune system attacking self or auto. So it is our part of our immune system kind of getting confused, going rogue, and beginning to point guns where it shouldn't. Typically, you point guns at viruses and bacteria, but it begins to point our guns internally at different organs and tissues of the body. So as an example, if it points the gun to the myelin sheath in the nervous system, we call that multiple sclerosis. If it's pointing the guns towards the thyroid, we call that Hashimoto's. Towards the GI system, Crohn's, or the skin, eczema, or the joints, rheumatoid arthritis. Analogy would be, you know, we take our Air Force, we take our, our Navy, and we send them out to Iraq. And for whatever reason, they decide to come back to the United States and begin bombing the territory here in the United States, right? It's a kind of a faulty mechanism, or, or possibly it's a faulty mechanism. The body, in essence, is trying to protect itself, which we'll see um, in just a moment. So what actually causes autoimmunity? Um, there's three major factors. The first one, of course, there is a genetic predisposition. So, you know, in your book, your chapter of life, uh, you have a specific chapter in there for autoimmunity, whether it be multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis. But again, whether or not that chapter gets read depends on the next two factors, right? And we know this primarily from migratory studies. So as an example, if we make up a, a statistic here, uh, just to kind of show the uh, uh, idea behind this, let's say that somebody in rural part of Western Africa has a risk of autoimmune one in a hundred. And let's say they implant themselves and move to some urban center in the United States, whether it be LA or New York, where it's highly polluted. Uh, they now have a new risk factor of say one in five, because they take on the risk factor of the land that they're actually standing on. And that's primarily have to do with the environment. And that's in essence what all these migratory studies show from heart disease and cancer to autoimmune diseases as well. So we have this immune, uh, sorry, this genetic component, right? That's the first part of this triad. And now the second part of this triad, we're gonna to refer to as you know, toxins and triggers. So this could be everything from like a biotoxin, viruses, bacteria, yeast, and fungi, getting a cold, to environmental toxins like mercury and other types of uh, heavy metals. Um, this could also be triggers like uh, the death of a spouse or a divorce or some kind of emotional trauma that your body goes through. Um, but they all have one thing in common. There's a thread of, of these toxins and triggers. And that is, is that it initially suppresses the body's immune system. And with that initial suppression, it allows other parts in the body to kind of go off kilter or like a domino effect spewing different toxins into the bloodstream, undigested protein materials into the bloodstream where they shouldn't be, and then the body begins to have now a hypervigilant response uh, to these toxins that are now entering into the bloodstream, and with that hypervigilant response, um, it gets confused, and it begins to uh, specifically maybe target a certain organs and tissues in the body, or through just simple friendly fire, um, it's going to, uh, whatever's in its way, uh, is going to get affected as well. So that's the second portion. The third one uh, of this triad, so we got you know genetic, 
we have in essence environment or toxins and different types of triggers, anything that initially can suppress the immune system and start turning on that book of life, that chapter of autoimmunity. The third portion of this is really the domino effect and the mechanism on how this occurs. So, you know, we have these toxins and we have these stressors uh, that enter into our body. You know, 70, 80% of our body's immune system is housed in the gut. So when you have stress, it's going to deplete the immune system uh, that's located in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so in essence, all of our barriers, right, the GI tract, the genital ur urinary uh, uh, tract, the blood-brain barrier, the respiratory tract, are all aligned with this mucosal border. And once it gets disrupted, things from the outside world can go in. Uh, typically, what the immune system is doing on all of these barriers, right, from the respiratory system to the, to the GI system to the blood-brain barrier, is deciding who enters and who doesn't. And when you have a disruption in that from these different toxins that are kind of acting like a razor blade and destroying and causing what some people refer to as leaky gut or intestinal permeability, what happens is, is that certain food uh, compounds um, do not get broken down appropriately. So typically you eat food, um, and if you think of it like a beaded necklace, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be taking these carbs breaking them down into a single bead called a sugar, or your fatty acids into a single uh, bead called fatty acids, and proteins into a single bead called amino acids. And the body understands that once it goes into the bloodstream. I mean, we literally are what we eat. We, food enters in our body, we break it down, and then we reconstruct it um, with these different beads into different tissues of our body. So if that's true, the very food that we eat is getting incorporated in certain tissues of our body. And so that would mean that there would be some repetition of this amino acid structure in certain parts of the body, whether it be the thyroid or it be the brain or it be the pancreas and so forth. And this is exactly what we find out. So as an example, let's just say that uh, dairy should be broken down into a single bead, but it doesn't. And let's just say this bead is carrying the letters D-A-I-R-Y, spelled dairy. And that goes into the bloodstream. The bloodstream, of course, doesn't recognize that because it only recognizes single beads. And so the body produces an antibody, or the immune system basically goes after this dairy, this undigested dairy uh, uh, amino acid structure. And it takes care of it. But interestingly enough, the letters D-A-I-R-Y are embedded in the pancreas. And so these antibodies that are fluctuating now look for tissue that's similar and now begin to attack the pancreas. And that's exactly what we see with studies with type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, and the linkage to, to dairy products. Uh, red meat is linked to uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and of course gluten is linked to celiac disease. And there's a whole host of mechanisms, but the basic gist of this is something called molecular mimicry. That's the name of it. And what's happening again is that first you get a destruction of the layers that are supposed to keep stuff from the outside world in. Once they get in, the body goes and delivers a hypervigilant response. Once that's cleared out, the antibody response now that is still present is now looking for something else to attack, and then it begins to attack tissue. So, you know, one of the biggest uh, foods, right, that are carrying an enormous amount of toxicity, of course, are usually higher up on the food chain. And so this is going to be all animal flesh, all animal secretion, especially those coming from factory farms, which is 99% of all animal products in the U.S. And then, of course, processed foods. You know, you got uh, food colorings and all sorts of different things that are in our foods, and their body's got to find a way to kind of get rid of these. And if it can't, because the barriers are broken, it's gonna spew into uh, the bloodstream and that causes a whole host of other issues. And particularly, besides proteins you know, uh, leaking in, uh, one of the ways that toxins, this happens with just plain old toxins and not food, is let's say that you know, uh, mercury, as an example, uh, is able to cross out of the uh, barrier in the gastrointestinal tract. And because of increased toxicity levels, the blood-brain barrier is also uh, destroyed. The mercury goes over the blood-brain barrier into the brain and attaches to different protein, proteins inside the brain. When the immune system comes now to, to take out that mercury, which is the most toxic substance on the planet, 
um, while it's taking that out, you have it attached to a protein, um, myelin sheath or whatever it may be, and so as it's trying to destroy that mercury, it's also going to be destroying the tissue that's in there. So with all that said, right, we have this triad. The treatment plan is really addressing those components. Um, there's not one person who has multiple sclerosis that is the same. There's not one person who has Crohn's disease who's the same. So there's an individual component that needs to be addressed and it needs to be multidimensional. So what we need to do uh, with our immune system here is we need to target and find out what is causing um, it to be depleted. So we look at different types of toxins, whether that be biotoxins like Lyme's disease or viruses or a recent cold or whatever it may be, and we begin the process to detox those out and to, to look and to remove them as best that we can. We also want to be aware of different parts of our mind and our spirit uh, that basically can create a spiral effect of getting our immune system uh, decreased. So, you know, when we have negative thoughts or we're surrounded in an environment that is not nurturing or uh, we're having uh, relationship issues, um, that's going to create a cascade of hormones, particularly cortisol, which is the stress hormone, could be raised up. And when that happens, it actually decreases something called secretory IgA, which is that mucosa that lines the gastrointestinal tract from the outside world to the inside world. So we want to address and we want to remove those. The Institute for Functional Medicine uh, is uh, one of the uh, leading researchers in the, in the field of autoimmunity. And uh, one of the best ways to initially start this treatment is through what's called the 4R program. So we just went over the first one, it's remove. Then we need to get in there and repair all the linings that have been destroyed. And there's specific ways that that can be done, uh, specific nutrients that can be done, uh, specific diagnostics that can be tested for to kind of find out which barriers have been broken and to find out if we're actually making the effect that we need. Then we wanna make sure that we keep that integrity there so we begin to re-inoculate the bowels to, with the good bacteria and, and the different types of probiotics. And then we wanna replace um, which is the last R with digestive enzymes or rebalancing of our hormones and so forth. And so there's a very systematic way that this can be approached to, to treat autoimmunity. So basically what I wanted to kind of end with here is that, you know, I was taught that, you know, to run the other way when you see an autoimmune case because you really can't do too much about it. And what I've learned over the last, you know, 16 years, I've been treating patients since 2000, is that there's so much more that can be done for autoimmunity. And once you do those types of things, you can begin to arrest the immune system and you can begin to arrest the autoimmune condition itself. Some people call that a cure, uh, but really it's just understanding that the body is should not, it doesn't, is not attacking itself on purpose. There's a reason for that. And if you can dig deep enough to kind of find out what those reasons are, you can begin the process of reversing this. Um, if you want more information, please visit our website. Um, thank you so much for listening.